Good morning. As we begin our service, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Western Abenaki people who have stewarded the lands and waters on which we are gathered for generations. Good morning, welcome. I am Meredith Warner, a member of the UCM board and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you for joining us in this time of worship from wherever you are. Whether you're on Zoom, on Facebook, or watching the service in your own time, we deeply appreciate your presence and fellowship. The Unitarian Church of Montpelier is a Unitarian Universalist congregation founded in 1864. We are a liberal, progressive, religious community that welcomes all as we journey together, seeking spiritual wholeness and justice in this world that we live in. Whether you are a newcomer, a longtime member, or somewhere in between, you are part of our community and we are glad that you're here. One person who isn't here is our beloved Reverend Joan Javier Duval, our UCM minister who remains on sabbatical leave until the end of this month. Virtus LeVar Robinson, our wonderful ministerial intern from last year is here and will be leading worship services until next week when Joan returns. If you're joining us in Zoom, the chat function will be on for much of the service. This is a great way to publicly welcome and support one another, to affirm the hard work and effort of our worship team, and to share good vibes and positive thoughts with each other. For technical issues or constructive thoughts, please private message the Zoom host or join us for coffee hour after this service to share them there. Thank you to our virtual greeters who are off offering hospitality and tech help throughout the service. Additionally, on Zoom, click on the live transcript button wherever it lives on your screen for increased accessibility. Again, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Now we will have a few brief announcements from our Director of Lifespan Spiritual Exploration, Liza Earl Centers. Thank you so much, Meredith. It's great to be with all of you in worship. My name is Liza Earl Centers. I use she, her pronouns. I'm director of your Lifespan Spiritual Exploration Program. And a few announcements. This is the time of year when we invite any of you to sign up for a chalice circle. That's our term for small groups that meet at least seven or eight times over the course of a few or many months. They're grounded in deep listening and the goal is to build deeper connection with yourself and with others in our congregation. And having been in some myself, they are always a real highlight of my week or my month. There are several different options for chalice circles small group ministry, soul matters, seasoned souls. And Virtus Robinson is starting a new chalice circle that is for anyone in our congregation who identifies as LGBTQ+. And you can find out more about all of these and sign up by looking at the weekly e-news. Um, there is an air quality project meeting this Tuesday at 530 and the tech, the tech team is also um, part of that project now. So any questions that you have about the air quality project or the live streaming, you can go to um, that meeting at 530 this Tuesday, September 28th. The Zoom link is in the e-news. Finally, there are two options for coffee hour today. You can stay in this meeting for a virtual coffee hour immediately after worship, or, and you could even come to both at 12 noon in the churchyard, the membership and hospitality team is hosting an outdoor in-person coffee hour. Uh, to keep things simple, at least to start, we are asking people to bring their own coffee or tea, a chair if you would like to, and they will try that weather depending today and the next two Sundays. In the coming two Sundays, Reverend Joan does plan to be there. So it's a great chance to see her. And speaking of Reverend Joan, here's a secret surprise announcement. 
We thought next Sunday when we welcome her back, how fun would it be to have a time when we go into gallery view with her and we invite everyone to hold up a sign. Welcome back, Reverend Joan. And we'll have some art making materials at coffee hour today. Or you could just in that moment, make a heart. We'll have a little fanfare to welcome back our Reverend Joan. And now I invite you to enter more deeply into our time of worship with our prelude. morning. My name is Will White, and I will be your worship associate this morning. Our opening words are from the Reverend Dr. Kristen Harper, entitled Each Day from the Voices from the Margins. Each day provides us with an opportunity to love again, to hurt again, to embrace joy, to experience unease, to discover the tragic. Each day provides us with the opportunity to live. This day is no different. This hour, no more unique than the last, except maybe today, maybe now among friends and fellow journeyers, maybe for the first time, maybe silently, we will share ourselves. Now please join in singing our opening hymn number 1020 from the Teal Hymnal, Wo ya ya, sung by fellow congregant Paula Gills.
Now let us light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We invite you to light a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Please join us in saying these words of affirmation, adapted from Universalist Minister L. Griswold Williams. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To seek knowledge in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus do we covenant. And now on to Liza Earl Centers for our time for all ages from the Children's Chapel. Thank you so much, Will. And it is great to be here in the Children's Chapel I love to see all of you who have your cameras on. It just fills my heart to see you singing along with Paula Gills. And even though I am alone in the Children's Chapel, it is a team effort to create today's very special time for all ages. I invited six families to help participate and they all said yes with very little notice. So a special thanks to all of those kids and parents who helped make this happen. And a special thanks to Virtus for co-narrating with me and to Meredith Warner for doing the illustration that you'll see and masterful video editing. So here is today's time for all ages. Did you know that love is a really big deal in Unitarian Universalism? I bet you did because we just can't stop talking about it. Oh, you're right. Love this, I would love that. Love will guide us. <laughs> I guess love really is a big deal to you use. I want you all to remember that because we're going to come back to that. And another big deal in Unitarian Universalism is our principles. They are a big part of our covenant with each other. They are things that guide us as a community. How we treat each other and what we want to bring more of into the world. Virtus, can I admit something? Sure. Sometimes I forget one or two of the principles. Well, I'm sure you're not alone. So let's get some wise Unitarian Universalists to help us review the basics of what each principle says. We believe that each person is important. We believe that all people should be treated fairly and kindly. We believe that we should accept one another and keep on learning together. We believe that each person must be free to search for what is true and right in life. We believe that all people should have a vote for the things that matter to them. We believe even working for a peaceful, fair, and free world. We believe in caring for our planet Earth and the web of life that connects us all. Thanks, everyone. I really needed that. They're good for all of us to review every so often. 
And you know what? When the Unitarian Universalism first came into being in 1961, there were only six principles. I just learned that recently. Just like each of us is always learning and growing, we know our principles need to grow sometimes too. Our seventh principle, the one about caring for the earth, was proposed 36 years ago when I was just six years old. After a couple years to consider and discuss it, there was a big vote and it was officially added in 1987. And so much of what we do at our church is about caring for the earth. That's huge. Literally, I mean, the earth is the biggest thing on earth. <laughs> yes, it was a very important addition. And a few years ago, some UU leaders suggested that maybe our principles need to grow again because the seventh principle left something out. Like many who'd come before them, these leaders spoke about how people still aren't being treated fairly because of the color of their skin or where they come from or other things that make them who they are. They noticed that happens not only in the world at large, but even in our congregations, even in this one. So they've proposed an eighth principle, right? But how does it go again? The eighth principle states, we believe in building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our congregation. Or in slightly simpler language, we believe in building the beloved community free of racism and oppression. Now I like that. And it makes a picture come to my mind. One way to imagine our principles is a keystone arch. This is like a doorway through which we enter into what our chosen faith calls us toward. It's kind of cool because the fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning is at the center, the keystone, holding together the space for us to balance between each individual's inherent worth and the needs of the great community of which we are a part. But do doorways or archways ever exist all by themselves, just floating in air? No, not really, right? They are usually stabilized on the ground, a part of a larger building or structure. So maybe that's what the eighth principle is, the ground upon which the doorway is built. And maybe it's the whole house of love. We are always trying to create for ourselves, each other in the world, a promise to fight against racism and oppression and to build a beloved community of love and trust and belonging here in our church and in the world around us. Yes. In 2023, you use from congregations around the country will gather at annual general assembly and vote on whether to add the eighth principle or not. And in the meantime, over a hundred congregations have already adopted it for themselves. And, then I, and at our annual meeting last year, our congregation decided to explore it this fall and vote this winter. So in the coming months, we'll be invited to explore the eighth principle together, learning about it and what it would mean for this community. And what it would mean for all of us. And we hope that each of you will explore these questions with us this fall. Our generosity is a form of love and gratitude. Our gifts freely given help us to practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. Each month through the UCM Community Pouch Program, 
We share a portion of our collection with an important church fund for a community organization aligned with our values. During the month of September, our community pouch recipient is People's Health and Wellness Clinic, located at their new address in downtown Barrie at 51 Church Street. Please note that this is the last Sunday of the month and your contribution to the community pouch will directly support their work. You can make a financial contribution today by donating online. Go to ucmvt.org and click Donate to UCM. There are options to contribute to the general fund, which supports the general operating budget of the church, the community pouch, or both. You can also mail a check to the church, or you can use our text to give option. Simply send a text message with the word give to 802-266-4848 and follow the instructions sent to you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for your generosity in its many forms. Danya Prince, our acting music director, will now introduce the musical offering for this morning. Good morning. The hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, was first performed in 1900 by a group of 500 school children at a segregated school in Florida. It was for an event marking Abraham Lincoln's birthday. In 1919, it was adopted as the official song of the NAACP and is known as the Black National Anthem. Today, it's presented by Shonda Williams, a Montpelier resident whom you might have seen performing with Lost Nation Theater or the Montpelier Community Gospel Choir. And I asked Shonda if she had anything in particular she wanted me to say by way of introduction, and she only offered this. The struggle for peace is real for everyone and injustice affects everyone. When we don't stand up for our fellow brothers and sisters in humanity, we all lose. This song is the black national anthem but reigns true for all people who are not free due to social and civil injustices everywhere. And I dedicate this song to those who suffer, whomever they may be. Hello, I'm Shonda Williams. Today I'm gonna to be singing for you, Lift Up Your Voice and Sing, which is the Black National Anthem. And I invite you to sing along if you know the words. And thank you again for having me. Lift every voice and see.
Friends, would you breathe with me? Thank you, Shonda. Thank you. This morning, we set aside time now to share with one another those joys and concerns that bring us into this time of worship. You may be celebrating something special in your life that you would like to share with all of us so that we can celebrate with you. Or perhaps you are experiencing a challenge, a loss, a grief that you would like to share with us that we can offer our love, care, and support. Susan Baker, our lay pastoral caregiver, is available this morning to lend a listening ear of care. 
She will be available during coffee hour by cell phone, and she will put her number in the chat for an after service call. And she will also be in our outdoor coffee hour as well. So at this time, please put in the chat your joy or concern so that we may offer you our love and support. I will not be reading these out loud today, but we will all hold them in our hearts and offer our support and love to you this morning. So please enter your joy or your concern or your sorrow in the chat at this moment. And we will honor all of them, including the ones that are left unspoken, that reside in your heart and in your mind. We honor those as well. And for a meditation today, as those chats are going through and our love and support is happening among this beautiful, wonderful community. I offer this meditation again by the Reverend Dr. Kristen Harper. It is entitled, The Breath of Life is Not Mine Alone. And be prepared because we're going to breathe a little bit today. So sit comfortably, lie comfortably, wherever you are. As we enter into a time of meditation. And she writes, I do not wish to breathe another breath if it is not shared with others. The breath of life is not mine alone. I brought myself to be with you, hoping that my inhaling the compassion, the courage, the hope found here, I can excel the fear, exhale the fear, the selfishness, the separateness I keep so close to my skin. I cannot live another moment at least not one of joy, unless you and I find our oneness somewhere among each other, somewhere between the noise, somewhere within the silence of the next breath. So friends, will you breathe with me? We're gonna breathe in, we're gonna breathe in compassion. And we're gonna exhale fear. And now we're gonna inhale courage. And we're gonna exhale selfishness very slowly. And now we're gonna inhale hope. And exhale separateness. Now do some breathing on your own, in your own time, whatever you need to breathe in and whatever you need to breathe out. And one more breath. Now join me in a brief time of quiet 
meditation, after which we will sing together, Spirit of Life. Thank you. And now we will have reflections in support of a congregational adoption of the eighth principle. Good morning. I've been asked to say a few words about why I support the proposed adoption of an eighth principle for us UUs. So, of course, I wrote a poem. <laughs> this one is called Fragile Old White Lady Awakes. Don't get me wrong. I know I'm not woke yet. I know it's likely to take what years I have left to get right. But I'm trying to listen, to learn. Because no matter what book my book club reads, in the text and the subtext, we find racism. We find exclusion, suppression, oppression, violence. We find a guilty history. It isn't all ancient history. Just one year after George Floyd, they killed 229 more Blacks. Police reform? How? Gridlock and recalcitrance. Seems like, yes, we can, became, no, you can't. Years of Trump, marches, summers of protest, guns, Latinos hunted, 23 gunned down in an El Paso Walmart. By a white man. More guns, more guilt, endless legal battles, eight dead in Atlanta, a spa killing aimed at Asian women. 
lethal oppression, suppressed votes, distressed folks. A friend limits her news intake, says it's just too awful. True. COVID is killing many more Blacks and Latinos than whites. Essential workers at risk for less than a living wage. Daycare closed down, children out of school, women out of work, stores and restaurants out of business. It still is hard to listen to the news. We campaigned, but after the election came insurrection, the new administration with narrow margins. So much to be done. Today's mail brought the usual. But look at this plea from the American Indian College Fund explaining that most native college students don't have enough to eat. Some don't have a place to sleep. We who do have food and beds must listen. We you use can turn to recommit to our principles, expand them. The eighth principle asks us to dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. This old lady says, yes, I'm in. Let the work begin. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Barbara Sue Stanley Thompson. I use she, her pronouns. I became a member of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier in 2013. I served six years on UCM's membership and hospitality committee. Today, I'm a little nervous, but so grateful to be speaking to you from our beloved sanctuary. I want to share with you what I have learned about the grassroots movement in our denomination to adopt an eighth principle and why I support it. It has everything to do with what I like about our congregation and what I have learned about Unitarian Universalism since I joined UCM nine years ago, shortly after moving to Montpelier from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was looking for a community and I came to our church. It was the first time I'd been to a Unitarian Universalist service and I liked it right away. I liked the vitality and intellectual curiosity of the people I met. I was inspired by the simple elegance of our building and sanctuary. But most of all, I liked the fact that the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism that were printed on a bookmark I found in the pews really spoke to me. I liked the fact that the music, the readings, and the spirit of the services soothed my soul. I went to a new UU orientation. I met more of the folks who were thinking of becoming members of UCM. I liked them too. I was curious when Reverend Joan described Unitarian Universalism as a non-creedal faith. How did that differ from other churches I had known, and how did it affect the beliefs and practices of the community? Non-credal. It meant that I didn't have to say the Lord's Prayer or participate in a communion ritual, which no longer held meaning for me. 
I could draw on the spiritual traditions of many faith communities worldwide. Even poets could inspire me with the wisdom I needed to lead an ethical spiritual life. Reverend Joan explained also that the beliefs and practices of Unitarian Universalism have evolved over time. That the community has changed as its members have made new choices based on their new understandings. I like that too, for it pretty much described my own experience and spiritual development so far. When I heard about the eighth principle a couple of years ago at UUA's annual general assembly, I was again curious. Can we just keep adopting new principles? Is there some new awareness, some unmet need that this principle addresses? How come I haven't heard about it? In fall 2020, encouraged by UCM's lifetime spiritual exploration, I was happy to participate in the beloved conversations course developed at Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago. This was designed for UU's nationwide to help us explore systemic racism in our institutions and unconscious biases in our individual lives. Over this eight week course, I learned more about the spiritual impact of racism on me, a white woman. The momentous events of 2020, the isolation of the global pandemic and the murder of George Floyd had rekindled my need to confront the systemic racism that is all too easy for a white person in our society to overlook. I wanted to learn more and to be engaged. Last year, members of our congregation joined together to form the Racial Justice Group. I was glad to join this work and to support the grassroots movement in Unitarian Universalism to adopt the eighth principle. I believe it will help us all of us to heal and grow our own spirits. Hi everyone, my name is Kathy Johnson and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been asked to speak about the eighth principle. So I'm just gonna read it because I want to comment on three parts of it uh, in particular. We, the member congregations of the UUA, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness, that's one part, uh, by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions, that's the second part, that accountably dismantles, third part, racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. So, I, as I was thinking about what to say today, the aspiration to journey towards spiritual wholeness is one of the first parts that I was really thinking about. And the eighth principle, in my view, is one of the ways that we can move toward um, affirming and promoting that we would all become more whole by becoming more aware of the ways that racism has impacted us and still impacts us and how as a community, as a beloved community, we can work toward that. The second aspect I wanted to name was that within the eighth principle, it talks about by our actions. It's not just about by what we think or by what we read or by how we talk with each other, although that's a huge part of it, but it's also about by our actions as people are becoming so much more aware of, as I'm becoming so much more aware of, the ways that the racist history of the United States has shaped racism and in, the, in white supremacy and enabled our institutions 
like our churches, like our schools, like our justice system, like our banking system, like our healthcare system, like all of our systems, they have racism embedded in them. And it's gonna take our actions to undo those, our actions in our jobs, in our communities, in our state, in our country. So the eighth principle asks us to aspire to that. So the third element I want to address is about accountably dismantling racism. And what does that even mean? And accountable to who? Accountable how? And I invite us to think about past, present, and future. In the present, Black Lives of UU, in 2013, eight years ago, asked the UUA to adopt its principle. Let's not wait any longer. Let's adopt it. Uh, let's be one of the congregations that responds positively to that request. And thinking in the past, like further in the past, there have been a lot of harms and anything that we do now can help our accountability to dismantling and repairing some of what's happened in the press, in the past. And finally, for the future, uh, for all of our children, for my child, for your child, for all of the children and our children's children, let's hand off a church, a congregation that is more and more racially just instead of holding back. So those are my offerings today and thank you very much for the time. Good morning. Naomi Shihab Nye, a Palestinian American poet has written a striking short poem, Cross That Line. The brief background is that Paul Robeson, African-American, was a famous football player, scholar, lawyer, political activist on the left, and a spirited bass baritone singer and actor. When he was banned, from international travel in 1952, the same year Naomi Shihab Nye was born, his supporters arranged for him to sing at the Peace Arch in Blaine, Washington, across the border into Canada. Here is the poem, which, in both, which both embraces possibility and offers a path for us at UCM to explore the eighth principle. Paul Robeson stood on the northern border of the USA and sang into Canada, where a vast audience sat on folding chairs waiting to hear him. He sang into Canada. His voice left the USA when his body was not allowed to cross that line. Remind us again, dear friend, what countries may we sing into? What lines should we all be crossing? What songs travel toward us from far away to deepen our days. Thank you, Sarah, Barbara, Kathy, and Peter for those reflections. As those of you listening from home consider the eighth principle, please look to the e-news and to the worship announcements for more opportunities to learn together in the coming weeks. The UCM Racial Justice Group will host a Zoom coffee hour breakout room today after worship. We'd love to see you there. Please join me in singing the closing hymn, number 1017, We Are Building a New Way, led by the UCM Choir. Yeah. 
Wonderful. And as we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of community, and the spark of hope into the days and the week ahead. There we go. Now let us join in and sing the mission statement of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth, our home. And now for our closing words. Our closing words come from my dear friend and former classmate, Andrea Hawkins Camper, entitled, Be About the Work. May we see all as it is, and may it all be as we see it. May we be the ones to make it as it should be, for if not us, who? If not now, when? This is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the work we will answer now, to be the barrier and the bridge, to be the living embodiment of our principles, to be about the work of building the beloved community, to be a people of intention and a people of conscience. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love. A reminder that we have two coffee hours, one immediately afterwards, we'll work five minutes, five minute break after the, the postlude. And join us here if you are comfortable right outside on School Street at 12. And now for our post lute song by members of the Montpelier Community Gospel Choir with a special guest.
Yeah.